Sal Rene to Southampton. Um, how do you see this move? How is it going to help in his development, his growth, the move from Sal Rene to Southampton? Well, it's an interesting move. Um, I think I've got I've got mixed feelings about it at the moment. I think I'm slightly concerned that he made an emotional choice based on a lack of playing time for Ren, and I think the the impact that that had on him not being very involved in the World Cup, I think might have made his choice to move in January um, more more deliberate and, more, and made him more determined to make that move. Um, and the result of moving in January is that you tend to have a smaller pool of teams that you can get transferred to. And he basically, it seems, had a choice of two teams, both of whom are fairly unsettled. They've got relatively new coaches or very new coaches in the case of Everton. And I think stylistically... Um, and, and structurally kind of behind the scenes that there, there, there are different stages on the one hand you've got Southampton who I think we can say on field are quite structurally and stylistically unpredictable we're not sure what they're going to look like in the long term under Nathan Jones but I think off the field we know that they have a very clear off field plan um, and then obviously Everton off the field are, are complete chaos but we think but I think you'd, it'd be fair to say that you know what you're getting with Sean Dyche um, and I think that he's probably made the, the right choice in the sense that he's gone to the team that has a, a clear off-field plan and he's one of a number of very, very talented younger players that Southampton have signed. Um, they seem to be looking at data. They're using data to assess players and analyse players and the players that they're signing uh, on the be on the sort of base of the data and on the looks of their performances in some cases, they've been intelligent signings. They just haven't been that effective as a team all season. So I think he's... He joins a team of very gifted young players, which I think is a positive. I think he's going to be one of the better players at Southampton. I think he's one of their most gifted players, certainly. And he's also going to be at a position that they're not strong at as a team. Um, he's shown the ability to play as a, as a front man in the two, which they do sometimes. He's also shown, of course, the ability to be a very dangerous winger. So I think in that sense, he's got potentially multiple positions that he can occupy in that team. Um, the only fear, of course, is that they go down and then potentially that really kind of youthful exuberant young squad gets gutted before they have a chance to gel and develop and he has he has about four or five he's about four months basically to to bed it to bed in and make a positive impression there and try and help them avoid relegation so it's a risky move but i think that there's i'd say, I'd say Southampton was the right choice out of the two the question i think is ultimately is whether it was right to move at this point scott you said he's made the right move what makes Southampton the best Please for him. Well, I think he's he's made the right move in the context of him wanting to move and him having the two options of Southampton and Everton. I think we've also heard that they had the option of of, of RB Leipzig, which perhaps would have been a better move. Um, I think out of Southampton and, and Everton, he made the right move in the sense that I think Everton have a clearer off-field plan. Sorry, not Everton. I think Southampton have a clearer off-field plan. I think that he's he's going to a team that has a proven record of developing and, and selling players. Um, and I think that they're following a, a, a clear structure of signing players who are young, who are, have a history of performing well statistically. Camel Dean has a fantastic statistical history, a consistent statistical history of high quality output and high, and high quality performances. Um, they're following a, a pattern. I think he fits that pattern. He's not an out of the box signing. He's not an unusual signing for them. So I think in that sense, he's made the right move. Leipzig, I think probably didn't. He didn't probably didn't go because. It would have been a similar playing situation to Wren. He might have been buried in the depth chart for a time. Um, and he seems very keen to play first team football. And from my perspective, I think he's more likely to get that at Southampton than Everton. And I think that they, they are off the field a better operation than Everton at the moment. So what is expected of him at Southampton? And what do we Ghanaians also hope to gain from um, Kamadi in this move? Well, I think in terms of expectations... The thing that we've seen from him consistently is that he's a really quality penetrative dribbler um, from when he first arrived in Denmark at FC Norgeland to now at Wren. He's he's one of the better dribblers. He's he's great at going past players 1v1. He's great in isolation. Um, he can create chances for others through his dribbling by accessing dangerous locations. Uh, he's a very high volume crosser. He passes to the penalty area at a high level. I mean, he's also a dangerous goal threat. I think it hasn't quite worked for him at Wren. I think they, they favour more experienced players. I think his defensive game isn't it perhaps isn't quite as good as it as it needs to be, and that may be an issue at Southampton. But I think the hope will be is that Southampton will kind of free him to be an attacking threat. They'll let him play to his strengths, and I think if he does that, I think he can be a, a, a very high level Premier League winger, which 
I think from a Ghanaian perspective, is exactly what Ghana need. I think it was pretty clear at the World Cup the team lacked creative spark. They lacked the ability to make things happen. Um, they lacked the ability to break down defensive blocks, have players that could go by, by, by opponents and create chances from nothing. And I think those are all traits that Kamaldine has. I think he's he's he showed in that cameo um, against Uruguay the ability he has, particularly in transition. Um, but I, I think what Ghana need is him playing regular football, him getting good coaching and him playing at a good level to kind of mature his game, improve his decision-making uh, and be a real force for Ghana on the world stage. Because I think if Kamal Dean comes good and if he achieves his potential, Ghana will have a really outstanding attacking threat from that from that position, whether it's left wing, right wing or up front. He can play all three. I think they'll have a really good option. I think that changes what Ghana's attack looks like, which I think for a long time now has been very stagnant. I said for your next court, Jalen, I ran to a data analyst. And now, Scott, let's move to our Premier League. After 14 weeks, what are your analysis and statistics so far? We just started the week 15 today, but the 14 weeks that we've played so far, what are your analysis and statistics so far? Well, I think the difficult thing with GPL is that there's not very many statistics on it. Um, kind of the, the stats that we do have, things like number of goals per game, it's one of the lowest in the world. Um, it's You don't see very many strikes being produced when you look at sort of numbers that we have on transfers. Not very many of the transfers are from the GPL are for a significant value or for any value. Um, teams are traditionally... The best leagues in Africa when it comes to the uh, rating of the leagues. I think there's there's a lot of issues. Um, I think. Let me ask you: the two clubs, um, in recent times, they are trying to bring in players from outside. Koroko have signed a second Brazilian. Had to focus signing some African players. What is your analysis on players that are brought in here to play in our league, especially by Asante Koroko and Had to Fo Do they perform well? Well, I mean, I think the kind of the best example of a player performing well was was Mbella. Um, at Asante Kotoko was basically the big one. Hearts of Oak should be much more like um, Dinamo Zagreb in Croatia, for example, or, or Porto and Lisbon in Portugal, where they, they are the finishing schools of Ghana's best young players. And it shouldn't be that those players are elsewhere at academies in Div 1, Div 2, or aren't even out, you know are outside of the division structure entirely. Because they're, they're independent academies and, and they're moving abroad that way, that's ultimately some an area that the Santa Cruz and Hearts vote need to be operating more intelligently. So yeah, we need improvement in our league from goalkeeping through defence, the midfield to attack. Where do you think we need improvement based on your analysis and the data you have so far? Well, I think. Ultimately, it comes down to coaching because I think there's a there's an issue with general kind of decision making, technical choices that are being made, and tactical choices being made by players. When you look at the data, um, a lot of the wingers dribble enormous amounts, much much more than you expect to see at kind of a higher level. Kind of a product, perhaps, of the the pit, the the, 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 the tactics used, the the space that they have. They're dribbling at high volumes. This is uh, statistics so far. Which club will you rate as the best so far? I think I think Asante Kotoko are probably the best team so far. I think they've taken a little bit of time. On Akuma 87.9 FM in Kumasi, we hope to speak to you some other time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All the best. Welcome. Okay, Enti, Yako Ahumano, so your name is Kot Jalen, a branch of or a data analyst, let's say Afrostat, a branch of a basic game, it's a say a course. And now games are cost on yes yet nasipa aye an analysis of the games. Ye per the data a APA free sa games no more. Yes the best and I would say yeah.